know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. It's a Wednesday morning at Shantaniketan and this prayer hall is open to all. To the lilting strains of songs composed by Rabindranath Tagore, time stands still. The venue of the prayer meeting is an exquisite glass house or Kanch Mandir inspired by the Crystal Palace created for the Great Exhibition in London in 1851. Built by Rabindranath Tagore's father, this little glass house is nestled in the woods, close to where the story of Shantiniketan itself started. Tagore's father, Debindranath Tagore, active member of the Brahmo Samaj, is said to have rested here en route to meet his friend, the local Zamandar, who owned this house and land around it. So touched was he with the calm of the place that he decided to buy this house and the land around it and create a retreat for meditation. It was his son Rabindranath who later transformed this into a laboratory for education and social change. Tagore always said that Shantaniketan was his greatest creation. So we headed out to Shantaniketan and its Kala Bhavan that celebrates 100 years of its being to trace the story of the man and his vision for a new India. At the art gallery that is part of Kalabhavan, the center of fine arts that has produced some of India's greatest artists, art historian and curator R. Shivakumar tells us how Tagore's tryst with Shantaniketan really started. It has many stages and sites to it. So it began around, I mean, 1890s when he was pushed by his father to go and look after the estates in East Bengal, which is now Bangladesh. So the idea was that he will go and look after the estates and you know, take care of the family property. But when he went there, he was exposed to the immense landscape and its beauty, that was one thing. And the second thing was that he was exposed to rural life and peasantry and their difficulties and uh, also their little pleasures and love, you know, happiness. And this changed him as a writer. He was sort of a romantic poet before that, but after going there, he became one of the finest short story writers and uh, writing stories around the life of these people. He also thought that we should do something for them. And this he tried to then take it to the Congress I mean, in the national annual meetings, where he didn't find enough uh, kind of admirers or subscribers to this issue. So then he thought he should do it himself. And he asked the artist, get out of this, I mean, studios in Calcutta, where you're sitting and thinking about the glorious past of India. Try to come here, get in touch with the people here, landscape, and you should reflect life today, its problems, and so on. And one person who kind of responded to it a little bit was not his nephews, but Nandalal Bose. So that's how they get close. And he started this school partly because he found the urban population was not interested in the rural. The rural population was skeptical of anyone from the city who wanted to go there and do something for them, like Tagore himself. So he thought this can be bridged only by a new kind of education. So that's why he starts Shandaniketan. He starts a school in the village where children will be exposed to rural ways of life and therefore we'll, they will develop a empathy for that. And the, he can also then bring all the scientific knowledge into rural reconstruction. So this led him to do two things. Of course, it, he would then want uh, to bring all that scientific knowledge into rural life and uh, agriculture. So he actually sent his son to study agriculture at a time where probably that was entirely new subject. So he went to, was sent to USA 
to just go and study agricultural science. And then he wanted the children to, I mean, kind of uh, bound with nature and bound with the rural life. So he took the classes in the open air. Of course, he also didn't have the money to do all that paraphernalia, but he also, as a child, disliked this old idea of being, you know, locked up in a room. So he got, he used nature as a source for teaching, one. And the second thing he thought was to create this empathy with nature. And there are stages in the growth of Shantiniketan. So Vishwabharata is a much later thing. It is a Shantiniketan that starts off in 1901 as a school. It had seven students and five teachers. Now, it was called the Brahmacharya Vidyalaya at that time, okay? A very kind of religious sounding name. But of the five teachers, three were Christians. Okay, one was an Englishman, uh, two were Indian converts, and one was a Brahmin, and a rather militant nationalist. Uh, so that was the composition. And one of the students was his own son. Okay? And he was also among the teachers. So it had a rather cosmopolitan look. And within a couple of years, he was also wondering, I mean, why should it be limited to this thing? Of course, he was impressed and I mean, influenced by the old idea of the tapovan, which he read about, you know, a rural retreat where education takes place. Now, he also then began to expand his horizon much more. So the first thing was to create a group of people who are educated uh, in a certain way that they would be sympathetic to rural life and its problems and would form a bridge. And then comes his involvement in arts because he thought arts is the main tool for creating that empathy. So he started composing songs and plays for the children. And great many of his plays were first enacted in Shantanigadan with teachers and students taking part. Later he traveled to Calcutta and so on. So he was writing primarily with this aim of culturally educating a small group of people. Now gradually this community grew because when he started it, there was hardly anything in this place except these few huts where the students stayed and he stayed and things like that. So then it started growing bit by bit. For Tagore, connecting with nature was core to learning and living. In the old heritage precinct of Shantiniketan, you can see the classrooms where young students from the school here are still taught. Tagore would teach English and Bengali here too. But as he taught, he also realized the need to open up young minds through art and music. An idea that grew as he traveled the world. In 1919, Kalabhavan, a school dedicated to the arts, was born. And as Tagore delved deeper into art, Shivakumar tells us he also changed the way he looked at it using far broader brush strokes. He saw the art world, and which was actually being dominated by his nephews, Abhinendranath and Gaganendranath. And he saw certain limitations in that. He thought it was too tied up with that historicist project, the glory of India, the ancient past, and trying to revive that glory and all that. While he agreed, probably we'll have to be informed about our past, he thought we should be able to do other things. So one was you respond to the vast hinterland of India, outside the cities, the villages, the kind of thing, and also respond to nature. And he had a reason for that. Nature is something that we all share across classes, religions, caste, whatever it is. So if you start your bonding with the place, that would be a common platform to develop a cultural outlook. So that's what he wanted. So he began to take a deep interest in the arts. It was not so much to create an art school initially, but he wanted to create that creative impulse in his school students. So he invited artists, various, Ashrit Kumar Haldar, I mean, Nandalal Bose, Shuren Kaur, etc., to come here. And Nandalal Bose was someone whom he found was more receptive to his ideas. So the next turning point, in a sense, was when he went to Japan for the first time in 1916. When he went there, he saw that 
art had a big role in Japan. And I mean, aesthetics touched every aspect of their life. So he says, if you go through the streets of Tokyo, you can feel that. I mean, people are more orderly, nobody honks. I mean, a driver would probably wait for a pedestrian to pass by. And uh, this is part of an aesthetic culture, he says. And he says it's everywhere. You go to the houses, they put mats so that you don't even, your footsteps are softened. And he falls in love with the haiku poetry and he says, look how visual it is. And then he looks at some of the artists, he is completely blown over. One thing he notices that the scale is big. Whereas the, his nephews in India were doing excellent painting, but very small, miniature, very intimate and so on. But this was public art to him in some sense, it's huge. And they responded to nature. And also he saw that there was a great economy in their art. Now he writes about all this to, I mean, Abhinendranath, to Gaganendranath, to his son So he says, you should come here, you should look at this. And this should be the model for art in India in a sense. Mm -hmm. It should be large, it should have this response to nature. It should, I mean, he writes like your, um, to Abhinendranath, he's right, your paintings are like prim gardens. But I want the huge forest, I mean, with thunder and storms and so on. Our art should be like that vital kind of thing. So, of course, his nephews didn't respond to these ideas very much. So he brings a particular artist to India from Japan, so that kind of the teachers. And Nandalal responds again to him, this artist. And um, then, in fact, um, he decides he should have an art school. Okay, so the art school comes later in 1919. The school came first in 1901. The art school comes later. Kalabhavan started with the intent of bringing art into everyday life here at Shantiniketan. It soon became part of a wider experiment in education and in art. They didn't start with a program written down, nothing. But he called him and said what he wishes to do is I mean, try to do art on a much larger scale, take art out of the studios, into public spaces, make art a part of the community's life, and um, try to develop a visual culture for India, a new visual culture for the modern India. So these were the broad brief he had. So they started doing mural paintings. So between 1921, and 51, when Nandalal returned, every year almost, there was a public art project on the campus. So it's strewn with murals. And out of that, we also, some of the great masterpieces emerged, Nandalal, Binod Bihari, Ram Kinkar, and so on. But the idea was, use these as a training program for the students in these murals or outdoor sculptures the teachers worked along with the students. So the whole Kalabon, which was a very small group of people at that time, they would all be engaged for a month or so doing a common project. So that also brought art into the, onto the walls of the university building, into open spaces where it is encountered by everyone. Now, besides this, they tried various other things. They contributed to the design of the festivals, because Rabindranath designed various festivals, which are also part of his, because I call this a effort at community building. So that was part of it. We already, I mentioned how this, he wrote songs and plays, which were enacted by the school children and teachers. He would continue with that. And then you need, I mean, scenography for that. That was done by these artists. He designed various festivals, and these festivals were all related to nature. They're not religious in character. I mean, festivals about planting trees, because this place, when he came here as a little boy, didn't have topsoil. It didn't, it didn't have any of the greenery that you see today. That was the kind of situation. So the greening of this place was one of the projects. And so he initiated tree planting, and he did a, I mean, designed 
a ceremony for that every year, which is still practiced. All of these festivals that he, I mean, developed here were all related to nature and secular in nature. Then he also thought that one way of improving the life of the villages would also to be uh, bringing in crafts. So he started Srinagatan where you had craftsmen, weavers, potters, all working together. And the idea was to train the local villages so that they would produce something and they would earn a little extra money. Tagore found a great ally in the form of artist Nandlal Bose who gave shape to Tagore's vision. Over time, Tagore got so fascinated by art that he took up the brush and became a prolific painter. Few realize that this Nobel Prize winning writer is also considered one of the nine greats or Navratnas of Indian art. Now that is a long kind of transition, like if he wanted to interact with this artist, he was trying to tell them what to do, and what direction to move in, etc. Sometimes they listened to him, sometimes they didn't, I mean, kind of thing. But he saw these things in Japan, he recognized, like the modern artists did in the West, that Japanese art was, on the one hand, responding to nature and was representative. On the other hand, it was also decorative. And it had this abstract quality. Then when he is travelling to Europe, which he did even before he travelled to kind of thing, he saw things like Art Nouveau. And the modern art in Europe, he realised, is also not basing itself on the old kind of representational values which he himself tried as a young man and failed. So he decided, I can't draw, and he left it. Mm -hmm. But during these travels, he realized there can be other forms of art, which doesn't need the same kind of representational skills. It has, I mean, he says, my training has been in rhythm, and he used to write beautifully. So his handwriting and his way of almost calligraphic handwriting, now he realized it has the same skills as the Japanese designer or the Art Nouveau designer who works with loops, then you have to have how to move a line smoothly, where to stop, how to regulate it and so on. So he realized that, okay, I have some of this skill. So when he looks at all this, he realizes there's another possibility in art which doesn't need the same kind of uh, skills in realistic rendering. So that is where he does. And unconsciously, even after he left his own eff early efforts around 1901, he begins to doodle in his hmm. books. So in his manuscripts, if you look, they're all full of doodles. And gradually you can see these doodles are becoming more complex. And the doodles begin to reflect what he sees in the museum. They begin to look like primitive art objects. So that is when he realized probably he can do something. So you can more or less date it to about, I mean, 1924, when he realizes through his doodles. Then he takes to actual painting on paper without doing doodles around 1928. And from there and between his death in 1941, he probably did 2,500 paintings. So it's extremely prolific. Uh, so the sizes might be small, but the imagination is much more vigorous than that of the Bengal school. The imagery, the emotional range is much more vigorous. Though Tagore passed away in 1941, Kala Bhavan continued to grow and over the years it has become one of the biggest launch pads for Indian artists. Still, we are getting students from different background, cultural background. And uh, I feel myself, I came also from village. Uh, so Shanti Niketan for me, it's totally, you it know, that uh, my place. I feel when I came to Shanti Niketan, I, I try to be in Kolkata uh, Government College, but, but when I came to Shanti Niketan, I feel this is this place for me. So that's why uh, I, I can say this from the uh, mostly who is the very devoted in, in art school, they are getting rising themselves. Now Dulal was pioneer and after that Bihari Ramkinkar, K.G. Subramaniam, they came. Later on, Jogin Choudhury joined very late. It's a, he joined around 87 when I was also a student. But before that, I got uh, Manida was teacher. So I have got some very influential and uh, renowned 
faculty member. Shantaniketan by the 1920s had come to symbolize Tagore and his vision. One of the first places Gandhi visited after he returned from South Africa in 1915 was Shantiniketan. Tagore and he shared such a close relationship that he entrusted Shantiniketan to Gandhi just before his death in 1941. From then on, Nehru and then Indira Gandhi, who also studied here, took care of it. Over time, it was given recognition as a deemed university and brought under the Central University Grants Commission or UGC. Old timers say a lot has changed, but the idea of Shantiniketan is as relevant as ever. Both Tagore and Shantiniketan holds many lessons for us. I mean, of course, the problem in India is that, again, you can turn these uh, individuals or institutions into icons and then do nothing, I mean, but pay respect. But one thing that Tagore would say is to be open, to be adventurous, to keep exploring. And as he said, don't be afraid of taking things. He said, all the cultures that are alive took things from other cultures. And it is only those people who are afraid of not being able to pay back will try to be insular. Others will always try to be open. And also to be brave to say what you want. I mean, these, I think, are the things that you can learn from Tagore. And Shantanian was an open-ended experiment. So I think that is what institutions should try to be. Uh, be sensitive to the needs of the time. And education should be uh, experiment. And he allowed that freedom to his teachers. He never went and told Nandalal what to do and what not to do. He said, we should try to do this. Now it's up to you how to do it. And he was very supportive, but never kind of prescribed anything. So he only wanted to see if he can drive and encourage people to move in a certain direction, nothing else after that. So that's probably what we need, that freedom to experiment, the freedom to kind of, you know, have your faith in your educators and try to pick the right teachers rather than, you know, kind of thing. Like Tagore had this because he himself didn't have these educational degrees. So he was willing and open to pick people and give them the opportunity. Shanti Niketan is today in Ireland, changing and yet somehow the same. And it is when you come here that you appreciate its simple earthiness and the grandness of the ideas and ambitions with which it was once set up.